So COP28 just finished in Dubai, and was this a victory? Well, let me put it like this. Imagine that you own a house, and that house is on fire. And you know why it's on fire. You watched your neighbour throw a Molotov cocktail through your window. And for the past 20 minutes, he's actually just been throwing more and more petrol through the windows of your house, making it burn more and more. And you called the fire brigade, of course, but after you did that, he then got in his car, drove it down the street, and just parked in the middle of the road so that the fire truck can't get to you. But about a minute ago, something strange happened. While he continues to throw petrol into your house with one hand, he turns to you and says, yeah, it's kind of my fault, isn't it? And then, in his other hand, he gets a super soaker, and he just starts languidly firing a jet of water towards your house. Is that a win? Look, I came into COP28 with very low expectations, as I think did most climate commentators. And you can see why. It was being hosted in a petro state. The president of COP28 was the head of the state oil company, and investigative journalists found out that that company was planning to use COP28 to sign more oil deals. So I came into this with low expectations, and the final text of COP28 is better than I, and I think also most people expected. But I share my opinion with James Dyke, who's a researcher at the University of Exeter's Global Systems Institute, who said that this deal has been hailed as a landmark is more a measure of previous failures than any step change when it comes to the increasingly urgent need to rapidly stop burning coal, oil, and gas. Sure, this is better than what we've been dealing with before, but that doesn't automatically make this a good final text. That's not to say that there were no positives that came out of COP28. I was very pleasantly surprised to see that for the first time, for three quarters of agricultural emissions, they are going to be included in countries' nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, which is like the carbon budget for each country. We also saw a similar agreement for emissions from cooling, which is another significant source of emissions from air conditioning and the like. There was also the early win at the very start of the conference on the loss and damage fund. We now have that kind of more formally set up, even if the amount of money that's been pledged so far has been pretty woeful. And the pledge from many countries to triple their deployment of renewables and double energy efficiency, which is something the IEA were calling for before COP28. But ultimately, COP28 will be judged on its final text. And more specifically than that, part one, article 28. This is the meat of what COP agreed, and in particular everyone's talking about subsection D. Calling on parties to transition away from fossil fuels and energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade, so as to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. Which I like to imagine was included purely out of spite by the COP28 chairman after those comments he made leaked. So this is notable because it is the first time that a COP final text has explicitly called out fossil fuels as the cause of the problem and calling for people to transition away from them. And that is a historic first, but again, that's only a historic first because we were so woeful at this in the past. And many headlines have been made about the fact that I believe two days before the final text was agreed, it originally included the phrase phase out of fossil fuels. And this was removed, allegedly, at the insistence of Saudi Arabia. Though it should be noted that other countries also objected to the language, in particular countries whose economies depend on fossil fuel extraction and were, not unjustifiably, worried about the energy transition that was coming. This is where I put my effective global agreement on climate finance. If I had one! And so we were left with this final text that calls upon countries to transition away from fossil fuels, which is quite fluffy. It's important to note that United Nations language is quite specific, so calls upon is not the weakest language that we could have got, we could have got requests. But equally, it's not as strong as urges countries or demands countries, which was never going to happen. So this final statement isn't as weak as it could be, but equally it is nowhere near as strong as scientists and activists were demanding. This isn't in line with what science is telling us we need to be doing in order to limit warming to less than 2 or 1.5 degrees. And while subsection D has got a lot of attention, I'd also like to draw your attention to subsection B, which calls on parties to accelerate efforts towards the phase down of unabated coal power. And the key word here is unabated, because in this context that's code for carbon capture and storage, or CCS. CCS refers to capturing the carbon that's emitted from burning a fuel like, say, coal, at the point where you burn the coal, and then burying it. And it's a technique that sounds eminently sensible, right? And it's certainly what countries that burn a lot of coal want to do going forwards, and it's what the companies that produce the coal are saying we should be doing going forwards. But I, I cannot be more explicit about this. It's not a solution. Multiple studies have been done, including by the IPCC, on whether we can keep burning fossil fuels but just do CCS to capture those emissions. And the answer is a resounding no. It is not a practical solution. 
It's, it's just not going to happen. So the use of the word unabated in this text, which I believe originated in COP26 in Glasgow, refers to a solution that isn't a solution. And this is the kind of language that we'll probably see going forwards in future COPs when we refer to oil and gas as well. So whilst it is good that coal has been singled out because it is the dirtiest, most polluting of the fossil fuels, it's still being singled out with this caveat of unabated coal use, which I, I, can't, I just simply cannot stress enough that CCS is not the solution to this. And what worries me is that going forwards, when we do have COPs that will explicitly call for the phase out of fossil fuels in general, I believe that it's going to use this language again, and it's going to talk about unabated use of fossil fuels, the phase down of unabated fossil fuels. And this CCS idea is going to be a crutch going forwards. Don't fall for it. Editing Simon here. I've realised that another important perspective to put in this video is, was COP28 a success from the point of view of fossil fuel companies? And I think COP28 was the ideal outcome for these companies. Like, if you think about it, they have positioned themselves, the UAE, a petrostate, was able to chair a conference that said, we need to transition away from fossil fuels. And they can point to the fact this was historic and they're really taking the climate crisis seriously. But if you actually dig into what the text says, it talks about the unabated use of fossil fuels, which means that petrostates and fossil fuel producing companies aren't going to be affected. It doesn't change their business model because they can continue to extract and sell, and in fact, expand their operations of extraction and selling to other countries of oil and gas and coal. But the onus is put on the people who are using those fuels to use CCS to capture the emissions. Doesn't affect those petrostates, doesn't affect the companies at all. And in fact, this gives them some really powerful messaging that they can put out in years to come that say, that says, we were there at the most historically important moment in the fight against climate change, and we agree, we need to do something about this, we need to stop the unabated use of fossil fuels. It is a colossal greenwashing win for these companies. And I, I, I just need you to come away from this video knowing that when they say we are taking this really seriously, I don't think they are. Anyway. I think a reasonable assessment of COP28 was this was an iterative improvement. Yes, a historic first, the first time we've talked about transitioning away from fossil fuels, but that is the most minuscule of steps forward. And if this was a problem that wasn't so time specific, if it wasn't so time critical that we actually implemented a solution now, then I think I'd be happy to chalk this up as a win. And this is just the nature of international negotiations. But this is a time critical problem, and every year that we delay taking meaningful action, as I talked about in my previous video, millions of lives are on the line. Over on Threads, where incidentally you can follow me if you like, climate professor Catherine Hayhoe pointed out that the promises made at COP28 get us to 30% of the emissions reductions necessary to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And every year that we delay meaningful action, the drop-off of emissions necessary to limit warming to 1.5 degrees gets steeper and steeper and frankly more unrealistic. So would you class a small incremental win at a critical time like this as a victory? Your house is still on fire. And sure, maybe the stream from the Super Soaker will partially save part of your garage, but the person responsible for causing the fire is still blocking meaningful action and stopping the fire brigade from arriving with their hoses. I should probably point out, by the way, at this point, that I believe limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius is not gonna happen. That is a practical impossibility at this point. The challenge, in my opinion, is whether we can limit it to less than two degrees of warming. And I genuinely believe that we can, I mean, you can watch the video I made a couple of weeks ago on that subject. I believe that that is practical and I believe it is possible but I don't believe that COP28 got us to where we need to be to accomplish that goal. Really, COP28 just reflected what countries around the world were already doing. They were already rolling out more renewables. They were already transitioning away from fossil fuels. But is that what we want COP to be? Do we want COP to be the place where people just turn up and put their bill stickers up and say, this is what we've been doing? And then the international community loosely agrees on a text that says, yeah, this is roughly what we're all doing. Is that the point? Or is the point of COP to get more ambitious and to improve cooperation and allow for more ambitious, more meaningful action? The next two COPs are in Azerbaijan and then Brazil. And maybe in two years time, just maybe, we'll see a final text that actually has some bite to it, that has some meaningful action on the phase out of fossil fuels. Not just unabated fossil fuels, but fossil fuels. Because 
in the next two years, I can guarantee you that the impacts of climate change are only going to get more and more obvious. By the time we get to Brazil, maybe we'll have enough ambition in the room to really make a difference. The question is, by then, will it be a bit too late? I don't have a sponsor for this video because I decided to make it super last minute. Originally, this was just going to be part of next week's video, which is a review of everything that happened in climate news in 2023. So if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button and make sure you don't miss that one. That means this video was entirely supported by my lovely patrons. Thank you to everybody who supports me over on patreon.com forward slash Simon Oxfizz. The names of people you're seeing on the screen right now are my executive producer patrons. All patrons get access to videos before they go out on YouTube. You also get access to exclusive behind the scenes content. I do a monthly vlog like my PhD vlogs used to be. And if you're a producer or executive producer, you get to vote on a video topic once a month going forwards. The past couple of months have been a bit disruptive because of, you know, baby. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that it was informative. Maybe it helped you form an opinion yourself on COP28. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like. There's some recommended viewing on the screen right now. And that just leaves me to say thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.